You're watching FJTN, the Federal Judicial Television Network. What happened was my son was terminally ill, <clears throat> and I have a sister that was involved in drugs and so forth. But, uh, one day she came home with Nod, and uh, I asked her what she had had, and she told me, you know, and I wanted some. And she told me she would never give it to me. So I knew eventually that I would get some because she needed money. And when she did, you know, uh, that was the beginning of everything. I lost my son. I lost my job. And I just started getting high all the time. And I lost my apartment and everything. And I just started going downhill. You know, uh, drugs was everything. Nobody really wanted me around and so forth. And I went to the streets. And when I went to the streets, I started prostituting, stealing, whatever it took to get the drug. And me and my daughter was on the street. Uh, her aunts finally took her, and I was out on the street again. By this time, I was living in an abandoned building, stealing, lying, manipulating, prostituting. It's just enormous by now, you know. I started smoking crack. You know, it's just a vicious cycle. You know, drinking crack and heroin. That's all it was. Jail looked good to me. It looked really good to me, you know. And that's what happened. And I was I was glad. I was really glad because I was tired. I was tired. I was tired of what was going on with me because all I had was an abandoned building to go back to. Even though I was clean now, it would just been a matter of time for me to get back in that cycle. Greetings to all in the viewing audience. I am pleased that the Federal Judicial Center has asked me to introduce this particular portion of the Center's Special Needs Offenders series. Today's program centers on women offenders and their children. I applaud the Center for producing the program. During the 1970s, when I was a law teacher and an advocate before the courts, my time was devoted primarily to advancing women's civil rights, their opportunities, their entitlement to equal citizenship stature. A significant part of that effort involved opening doors once closed to women, working toward women's full equality with men, while taking account of the reality that the two sexes are not the same. Only by appreciating women's distinctive lives can we be sure that our laws and institutions neither unjustly discriminate against women nor give them unwarranted special treatment. Turning specifically to this video program on women offenders and their children, Department of Justice statistics show a 500% increase during the past 20 years in the number of women in prison. That dramatic increase makes it all the more urgent for our courts, pretrial services, and probation system to ensure that women apprehended, tried, convicted, and sentenced for criminal conduct are dealt with fairly and sensibly. I have several times cautioned against overbroad generalizations about the way women are, because such generalizations or stereotypes are often unhelpful when making decisions about particular individuals. At the same time, one should appreciate that women, like persons of different racial and ethnic origins, contribute to what a fine judge once described as a distinctive medley of views influenced by differences in biology, cultural impact, and life experience. In that sense, 
women defendants and offenders in the federal system as a group merit attention as women. It will not do to simply treat them as soft men. To take the prime example, women much more often than men are the sole caretakers of young children, and women are less likely than men to have prior records. Further examples are set out in the Special Needs Offenders Bulletin that accompanies this broadcast. Because women should be treated as equal in stature to men, but not identical to men, female defendants and offenders present special supervision and sentencing challenges to the court, pretrial services, and probation. Let me pose a few illustrative questions. How should we handle a first-time defendant or offender of limited financial means who is unmarried, pregnant, and a drug user? What do we do when, as is all too often the case, the woman is a mother who alone has custody of minor children? How do we help women gain the treatment, education, and training necessary to improve their lot in life upon release? We should remain ever mindful that decisions we make at every stage of the criminal justice process inevitably affect others. Decisions about women touch and concern their children, relatives who become substitute caretakers, and the larger community. From the pretrial services report to the pre-sentence report, from the sentence itself to the supervision plan, these real differences require appropriate consideration. Today's program is designed to provide you with a better understanding of the special sentencing and supervision challenges that women often present and to offer insights about meeting those challenges. It is wise to listen attentively to the Council of Professionals who collectively possess a vast amount of knowledge bearing on women defendants and offenders. Many of you have had experience working with women offenders. I urge you to engage that experience. Do not simply sit back and listen to the discussion, but participate in it today and continue it in the course of your daily work. Welcome to Special Needs Offenders, Women Offenders and Their Children. Our first case deals with the pretrial and post-conviction supervision issues of Kara Jones. Here are the facts. Defendant Kara Jones is a 35-year-old mother and primary caretaker of three children, ages 11, 13, and 15. Jones and her husband Richard were indicted on three counts of credit card fraud. Kara and Richard Jones have recently separated. Kara Jones pleaded guilty to one count of unauthorized use of an access device and aiding and abetting. She's eligible for a short period of incarceration, less than a year, or a term of probation. She was released on personal recognizance bond and is under pretrial services supervision. In addition, Jones has a history of chronic low-level depression and before her involvement in this case, she obtained psychiatric treatment for her depression under her husband's health insurance plan. Defendant Jones is anxious about her children. She won't so show any weakness in front of them, and she's particularly concerned about her five-year-old who exhibits behavior problems. Jones has a history of physical and emotional abuse by Richard and in prior relationships with men. Her employment has been sporadic so she supports herself and her kids on public assistance and food stamps. Jones has no substance abuse history and no prior record. Finally, Jones's disabled mother lives alone near her apartment and Jones must often assist her. 
Cindy Sadi, pretrial services officer from the District of Maryland, let's start with you. And let's step back a little bit in the facts um, at the pretrial stage of the case. Uh, what issues are going to be of the greatest concern to you in light of the facts as, we know, as you will know them at that point? Okay, well, as of every case, we're going to address the issues of non-appearance and danger first right. and make appropriate recommendations that are hopefully least restrictive also. In her case, um, I think some of the prominent issues initially, at least, is her mental health status. And the case scenario doesn't provide a lot of details, but hopefully the pretrial investigation would have brought about a lot more information, and specifically, like, how recent was she in treatment? Was she taking any medication? Is there a history of suicide attempt? Yeah, is, that like information, that? is that information that she's going to give you uh, during the course of your own investigation, or how are you going to get that? She may. She may give it to us very willingly, but generally we would ask her to sign a consent form so that we could contact a treatment provider. Her family members may provide a lot more information than she will have. Um, generally those are the, the primary sources of information. And most likely we would recommend a mental health treatment condition. Okay. Um, additionally, there may be a need in her case for a no contact condition. Okay since there is an abusive relationship going on with co-defendant who is her husband. We don't know from this information, is he detained, is right. he released, but that may also be a necessary condition. Good. Let me stop you there and okay. go to our other pretrial services officer on this panel, David Jones, uh, Western District of Pennsylvania. David, anything to add or elaborate upon? I agree with Cindy. Uh, making the appropriate mental health referral would be the key issue in this particular case. Okay. Uh, judge Garvey, let's go to you. Uh, you're the presiding magistrate judge in this case. Uh, what's your reaction to what both Cindy and David have said thus far, particularly in terms of the recommended special conditions? Mm -hmm. This is a case where uh, we turn to the for future court proceedings and in terms of danger to the community that this woman, it's, she's been convicted of not a, a crime of, or pled guilty to a crime not of violence. There really isn't any serious question, I think, in anyone's mind that she will return in the future, her contacts with the community, and that she's not a danger. However, uh, this is sort of a perfect case to talk about. She's already pled guilty. We have to begin thinking about her future from this point forward. So perhaps we should be thinking about uh, employment or education, at least getting her thinking about what she's going to do in the future. She may not serve any time, so we have to begin having her think about how she's going to handle a sentence, if she is sentenced, or how she's going to support herself and her children in the future. Now, let me, is that something that you'd like to see as, as a condition, or let's right. talk about that a little bit. Uh, it, it may not be absolutely essential to be a condition, but I'm a believer that, the, and, and we talked previously, that the Chinese character, I think, for crisis and opportunity are the same. And this is an opportunity for her and for the pretrial services, for the justice system to intervene. So I might not make it a condition, but I certainly would have hope that the pretrial service officer was talking about it and using this time, this crisis opportunity, to really get her thinking in the right direction. Okay. Before we go to counsel, I want to go back to Cindy and to David to get your reactions, particularly on this idea of the employment as a condition or a risk to be, you know, or as a risk factor to be watched. How would you handle it being on the front lines? Well, based on the facts in this scenario, it appears that she's able to support herself and her children with public assistance. And given that case, um, making employment a condition may actually complicate things for her at this time. It's, you know, pretrial stage is short and it's stressful enough um, without adding the requirement that she be working. But I th certainly think it would be a critical area to keep track of, you know, during her period of supervision to keep monitoring and see how is she doing really and we certainly have the ability to direct her to resources or assist her without having to require her to work. Mm -hmm. David, reaction to that? Yes, I think that if she does well in her treatment, her mental health treatment, and as she progresses then the job issue could become more of a likelihood. Okay, uh -huh. and I think that raises that this is a, 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 a process we're talking about. Yes, this it's is an ongoing something. assessment uh, that we'll, as we spend more time with the defendant we'll be able to assess how she's doing and being in contact with her treatment provider. That can give us great insight. Good point. Judge, how would you feel about that approach? I think that's an excellent approach I, it, because sometimes these individuals do stay pre-sentencing for a long time for a variety of reasons that the lawyers could probably 
talk about. And I do think that the court is happy to be involved as, as the progress and the process continues. And I'll be interested to hear about what the defense lawyers, how they feel they can best use this time in, in working with the individual uh, in maximizing um, this time for her as well. Well, this is, this is one of those rare cases where everybody is in agreement that this is a case that doesn't warrant detention. There's just an issue of whether and what condition should be imposed uh, for release. And I agree that the mental health issue is one to focus on, given her, given her history and the kind of stability that um, a focus on that could bring in terms of her success on release. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with what's been said about the employment situation because based on the facts that we have here, She's uh, apparently dependent on her husband, who's a co-defendant, and that uh, aid that she's relying on from him will no longer be available. Um, and she's going to need to be able to sustain herself at some point in the future and her children. Right. So, but I do think initially the focus on uh, employment as a condition of release would be premature because she needs to be stabilized first. But because it is a nonviolent offense, and she's on pretrial release, presumably this would be a more s extended period of pretrial supervision than is ordinarily the case, because hopefully she would be a candidate for post-conviction uh, release supervision if, in fact, it results in a guilty plea or some other type of disposition. Right. So she would continue under the supervision of pretrial services. And this would be a wonderful opportunity to establish a collaborative process uh, between defense counsel and pretrial services and with uh, the prosecutor to try to put in place the systems that she needs and to try to encourage her to be forthcoming with the information with respect to her mental health history that would aid in that process. Very interesting. Bob Spagnoletti, uh, the, the government's position. Well, I, I agree with Sig. I mean, I don't, I don't think that this is a case where the government would be seeking, obviously, any kind of a, a detention status for um, the defendant here. But one of the things that we are concerned about, uh, I agree with the judge that she doesn't pose a risk generally in that this is a nonviolent crime, but the f indicators are here that there is a huge risk to the children in that the research has shown that children that live in the home in homes with domestic violence are oftentimes the subject of abuse themselves. That is not only by the abusive spouse, in this case Richard, but by the defendant as well. As women get stressed out because of situations such as this, because they are the victims of domestic violence, they also sometimes can direct that, that anger, that frustration at the children, and they act inappropriately. I think that's a really important point because intuitively one would not think that the victim of the abuse would then visit that abuse on their kids, that they would be going out of their way not to do that. Exactly. But I guess in the course of the stress... The research, That's what happens. the research does show that the women who are the victims of domestic violence, ha there is a risk factor, a huge risk factor, that they will act out violently on their own children. And again, with all these stressors in her life, that certainly is a risk. And she has a mental health issue that needs to be addressed uh, as well. So I think that that would be something I would definitely bring to the attention of the court and pretrial services to make sure that she knows about the resources that are available to her there may be a domestic violence outreach program that can help her. In the District of Columbia, we have an intake center where she could address all the things that I'm sure is on everybody's mind here. You know, who's going to have custody of the children? Is there a custody arrangement in place if he's going to be ordered to stay away? Mm -hmm. Does he have visitation? Is there support? We have a visitation center here in the district where she could drop the children off and he could visit without having contact with her, thereby allowing them to comply with the no contact order but permitting him to have visitation, if appropriate, with the children. So that there are other things out there that can make it more likely that she will succeed in this pretrial phase and minimize the risk to the children that they will be hurt in the process. Good point. Um, several good points there. I, I think w one thing that we want to tease out of this is that uh, even though uh, the federal courts don't deal with domestic violence cases so much on their merits or front and center um, because of the difference in dockets between state systems and the federal system, this is how these cases can, or domestic violence can present itself within the federal courts and the importance among federal personnel who, criminal justice personnel who will be dealing with it or ju the judiciary, the judge, pretrial services officer, later on the probation officer, the familiarity that they'll need to have 
with the local systems and the state systems that deal with domestic violence, with juvenile issues, and in the case of children who are involved, that kind of thing. We'll get more into that later on in the broadcast. It seems essential to me, and you all are dealing with it on a daily basis, especially you, Bob. That's right, and, and I would say that the, I think we're going to see on the federal docket more and more of these domestic violence offenses. We now have had Domestic Violence Against Women Act criminal laws that, have, that were passed back in 1994 right. that are being used more and more across the country, and there are there is interstate stalking, interstate acts of domestic violence, that is traveling interstate or causing somebody to travel interstate to commit an act of domestic violence, interstate violation of a protection order. So there will be, and we are seeing an increase in the number of these domestic violence federally charged cases. A couple of things to mention, um, and that is that October is National Domestic Violence Awareness Month, hence our uh, little ribbons um, to commemorate that, uh, and also um, that, uh, again, the, the, the ability to uh, get hold of these local systems and these state systems, nowhere to turn um, when you've got a case that presents a domestic violence uh, situation, I think, is critical. Susan uh, I, Galbraith, I wanted to turn to you um, as our resident clinician here to give us your analysis of the issues here, how you would handle it, what you think the, the, the main issues are for uh, the system to deal with. Right, and we are one of those local system, one of those local that's providers, right. community-based providers. Um, I would agree with everything that's been said. I think that the depression is a very important issue that needs to be addressed up front. She's not going to really be able to move forward unless her depression is treated. Um, I would ask her what she identifies as her most pressing issues. Um, and to follow up in terms of the concerns around the children's safety, she did identify that she's really concerned about one of her children. Mm -hmm. I would um, talk to her about that concern. I would use her own identification of that as an opportunity to get the family into, to get the children into some therapeutic services as well as the family. She is, I imagine, a very isolated person given the way in which you've described her circumstances and I would want to see her connected with organizations with other women who have walked in those same shoes where she can get a sense that she's not alone she can identify with other women and know that there's some community support mm -hmm. for her that she just doesn't have to do this by herself mm -hmm. now uh, uh, going back to this notion of employment as an issue I mean we've got somebody here who is may perhaps be incarcerated for a very short period of time, but even more likely, really, uh, may get this term of probation. Um, can you speak to that? Well, I think it's important to, again, get a sense of what she's thinking mm -hmm. about it. Certainly for her future and her family's future, she's going she's gonna to have to think about em employment. Mm -hmm. And um, I would talk with her about whether what she likes to do, what she has ever done, what is her educational level, what kind of skills does she have, uh, at least to begin to think about the future and look at the future in a hopeful way, that there are resources and opportunities available to her that we can help her avail herself of. Mm -hmm. So while, while employment, I, can, I, can, I think the recommendation that employment not be a condition, I think uh, Employment may be one of the, the most hopeful things in the future for her and, and may provide a lot of incentives for her to be moving forward in her life. Mm -hmm. Judge Garvey, I saw you nodding your head. So yeah. I was just thinking. Get into the fray here. Yes, I was just thinking what a challenging case this is for pretrial services officers because I was thinking of the term, the sandwich generation, if you remember that. Here's a woman who's right in the middle. She's got a mother who's disabled, who's relying on her, and she has children for whom she may well be the sole provider. So her, the most nagging concern of this woman is going to be, how can I provide those who are dependent on me? And I don't know whether our system really has available to pretrial services office the way to really address this woman's very considerable needs to get her right on the right path to become a protective citizen. So Dave, I don't know what your I, reaction it's is. It's very important that we're resourceful. You have to be creative. Um, prior to working for the federal government, I was employed with juvenile court back in Pittsburgh. And you can often give a call to a children and youth services worker or to a uh, ex uh, co-worker and ask them well, what resources are available in your area. And that can be very helpful. 
um, as far as getting the children involved, which is going to be paramount for the defendant mm -hmm. to make a successful uh, adjustment under pretrial supervision because if, if her children and if her mother aren't being taken care of, she will probably not do well. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that you're going to have to be resourceful at the pretrial services. I mean, both pretrial services and the probation officer mm -hmm. ultimately Certainly. and sort of thinking outside of the box and coming up with resources in the community and networking. You know, that brokering and mapping that we referred to in the Special Needs Offenders Bulletin, uh, both for this program and for the Reducing Risk Through Employment and Education program. Um, really important. I, and I want to come back to Cindy because, Cindy, you dealt with a case that was very similar to this and, in fact, this case is in part based on the case that you worked on. And I wonder if you could talk about that in terms of particularly the services that were available to the kids. Sure. Um, well, in her case, we actually were lucky in that our treatment provider volunteered his services to her children. Um, since that was an issue that she was bringing forward every week and saying, you know, I have this um, you know, teenage boy who is acting out, who's having trouble dealing with not only his own issues, but the uncertainty of what she's facing and what's going to happen in the, you know, the next couple of months with their family. And so the treatment provider volunteered it and it, it made a lot of difference in her outlook and her ability to cope just having a child that was now able to speak with someone else and he really seemed to benefit from it. But I think that's outside of the norm and we don't generally have that available to us. So it would mean kind of looking in other places and into the community for who could help the children with her at the same time. And keeping in mind that we're kind of limited in what we're able to do. We have a lot of, the pretrial officer has a lot of constraints in terms of not only the time that we have with her, but we're limited by statute in terms of what we really can do and how invasive we can be, particularly if, you know, the, the children aren't under our supervision, it's the defendant who is. And there are layers of issues here that we have, again, as Cindy stated, a very short time to deal with. Right. So for the pretrial services officer, our success is in very small intervals. That's a good point, Judge well, Goggins. But you, but you, can't, you can't buy, uh, you can't contract for then in, inpatient mental health if that was considered appropriate, and you can't really buy services for the children, family therapy or individual therapy for the children. That's just not within your purview. Right. right. And that makes it really challenging. Right. Sig? Yeah, this may not seem like an intuitive concern for defense counsel to have, but in the immediate stage, the pretrial stage, it actually is a collateral concern. It's very important in terms of stabilizing the client so that she can focus on the very important decisions that she's going to have to make later on the merits of the case. And in this case, uh, this is a woman who not only has a personal history of depression, but as is always or often the case, she is also the primary caretaker, mm -hmm. uh, which is more uh, the case often with women than with men. And um, she's concerned not only about this daunting uh, criminal matter that's facing her, she's a person who has no significant criminal history, so she's probably traumatized just by being in the process mm -hmm. and faced with an uncertain prospect for not only herself but the future of her children. Mm -hmm. So this is a real critical stage for a collaborative effort to try to get her the services that she needs so that when she comes to the point in, in later phases of this criminal process where she's got to make very critical decisions, mm -hmm she can process her options in a very clear-minded way. Or I mean, as you're talking, as you're way. talking, it remind, I'm reminded of the fact that she has no prior criminal record. Right. I mean, this is her really probably, I mean, on the facts, her first time involved in the criminal justice system. I mean, and she's got these kids that she's got to take care of. She's on public <laughs> assistance and food stamps. She doesn't feel skilled, apparently, in any way, and perhaps isn't skilled in terms of uh, job skills, you know, uh, Susan and she's comment using, on that. You know, she's separating from her husband, right. the father I mean, of her, her life kids. Is her apart. life is falling apart, and she's l and she's separating from the primary caretaker, the primary breadwinner mm -hmm. or provider, mm -hmm. however you define that in the family. So she's going to be, I'm sure, very afraid of how is she going to pull this all together, mm -hmm. and. That's why it is so important that she has a sense that there's going to be some support for her to pull it together mm -hmm. and that it's possible to pull it together. Mm -hmm. And, and y we have to look outside the, cr the system to the community to figure out who is going to aid her in that process mm -hmm. because there has, she's, she needs the community to help her get through this. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Cindy. I was going to say, Thanks. actually, the, the real case that this is based on, to throw in another factor, she's actually uh, suffering with cancer. And so that's yet another um, 
thing that she's dealing with and actually dealing with very well. I mean, she's mm -hmm. remarkable mm -hmm. in how she handles all these different issues that are going on and the treatment that she's receiving for that at the same time. So there's an, another issue that she's facing, you know, perhaps it's even more serious than what's going to happen with her legal case, but is she going to be able to beat this possibly terminal disease right. and still thinking about her children and where are they going to be, et cetera. So. I mean, I just think it's so important for her to feel like she has some control and power in her life, and where is she going to get that, and where can that be reinforced, and that, because if she continues to feel powerless and hopeless, she's going to be overcome by the depression, she's going to be overwhelmed by having to care for the kids, and I think you're absolutely right, everybody is going to be at risk in that situation, and it's not simply a matter of going out to all these different community agencies, it's a matter of knowing that somebody's in her court with her and is going to help guide her through this process and help just the simple things. If some of her basic needs start to get met, if she says, I need help for my son and she gets the help for her son, then she has a sense that people are, understand her, are listening to her, are going to respond to her needs mm -hmm. and that success builds on itself. Right. I, I, and I, to emphasize, I mean, this is a, this person is in a very fragile position, and your reference to you just don't want to set her up with resources. You want to check out those resources. I mean, yesterday when we were rehearsing this thing, you talked about the importance of making sure the resources that you are uh, referring her to, if that's the case in the community, you know, are actually going to be helpful. And how you would go about doing that? Can you just well, elaborate I mean, on that a little bit? Well, I mean, just nobody can be no. We all get frustrated when we make a call and ask for something and they tell us to call the next person yeah, right. or to come in in two weeks. or That's not a response that's helpful. So you want to make sure that you're, you're getting her connected to resources that are going to respond to her quickly, that are going to actually provide a meaningful response. Mm -hmm. And you don't want this family waiting for six weeks before they, this, the child gets into individual counseling. You want to have some you really want to monitor what's going on with these referrals and you want to know that they're of a high quality and the, there's no substitute for developing a relationship mm -hmm. with all of those people you're working with. It's mm -hmm. my call to Cindy that's going to make that happen or my call to you that's going to make mm -hmm. that happen. It's not her call to the receptionist who may then fill her in to come in six weeks from now. Mm -hmm. and. I just think it's really incumbent, especially in a crisis situation like this, on, on everybody to be very thorough in making sure that those connections are made mm -hmm. because she will fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. She's depressed. She's mm -hmm. a prime candidate to fall through the cracks. Mm -hmm. and, you can, and you can really use the judge. The judge is there to help. I have called recesses in my court courtroom and we have then gone and made a phone call to, to a provider or I've said, let's get the person on the phone right now in the courtroom. Because I know that that immediate call will get some immediate attention. And as you say, these are people frequently who are not skilled like we are on how to work the system and get the answer. And so I think we need to use the pretrial services office, need to push the envelope for themselves and really ask the courts and the defense counsel and prosecutors sometimes to work collaboratively, like Sid has said, for this person's best interest in moving through to become a productive citizen, yeah. staying in, in touch, going through the criminal justice system, and then becoming productive citizens. During the course yeah. of this, uh, the, initially the defendant is very nervous and anxiety ridden, and then as the dust starts to settle, it's going to be very important that we keep in contact with them and to know and to help them talk about what they're feeling in the whole process because so much of what you talk about, their initial parents, it's all going over their heads. So when they come to our office, when all is said and done, bond has already been set, they're able to come home, then we can start to build that professional relationship that's so very important. Mm -hmm. and Bob, I, was, I, wanted, I, I, I wanted you to comment, so go right ahead. And, yeah. and I would just point out that the judge makes a very good point in that she is a defendant in this case for credit card, credit card fraud, but she's also a victim of domestic violence. And in that role, as a prosecutor, for example, I'm plugged into lots of different things for victims of domestic violence. And so although I have to approach it in one direction to start off. At this stage, we're looking at what the conditions are. I have every interest in the world of making sure that she is safe as a victim, her children are safe, mm -hmm. to prevent them from coming back in the system mm -hmm. as victims of crimes as well, or to go on to grow up and learn bad things and then take that out on other people. 
So we do have these, we do have connections. So I think those, those, uh, that communication, even with the prosecutor, um, by defense counsel, for example, is a, is a wonderful thing. I want to, I want to actually, that was what I want, was hoping you would hit on because, and we really didn't rehearse this, um, <laughs> because, uh, I mean, we're acting like it's one big happy family here. Uh, it, this is still an adversarial process, but you all are advocating a significant degree of collaboration among the parties. Judge Garvey, I think it's extraordinary. What you just described that you would do is extraordinary, and I, feel, I think that you're bringing in your prior professional experience and your experience as a board member in a women's shelter in Baltimore. And I, I just was wondering if the maybe council could comment upon that, because we're so used to this being adversarial. You could talk about the balance, and we'll get to that more in our second in our second uh, panel as well. My job is not to, to prosecute. I mean, it's part of my job. My part, my job is to do justice, to investigate, and make make good decisions, and exercise some discretion. And I, I, I mean, I would agree with Sig. I mean, here's a case that where there's no indication that she should be held whatsoever. But there are warning signs every place mm -hmm. that we have to do things to make sure that nothing else bad. Could happen. Am I prosecuting the case? Absolutely. Am I dealing with SIG to, to work out what needs to be done on a legal basis? Absolutely. But there are people involved here. There are children involved here. And if I can see the things that can be done to help along the way, to put the family in a better position, to make it more likely that she will succeed mm -hmm. in whatever pretrial or post-trial mm -hmm. requirements she should have, then by all means it, it is in my interest, my client's interest, the government of the United States, the people of the District of Columbia, as it were, to to do that, and so I, I have every interest. Now we're certainly not going to agree on everything, and in the next scenario, we, we there will be some right. things pointed out there. Right. But here we won't go there yet. Yeah, but here, but here it's clear that that it, there are things that I can do to help this family, uh, and still do my job. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with all that's been said, and and I think it's important to recognize a few things. One is that in the case of Bob and I in particular, we have adversarial roles. Uh, but that's not to say that we have to be adversarial about everything that's involved in a particular case. And there's the merits of the case and there are collateral issues, and we may actually agree on uh, some of the collateral issues and disagree on the merits. We may, in fact, dis agree on some of the merits and disagree on the collateral issues, but we have to work through them. And in this particular case, it pre presents a kind of unique situation because this is a situation where, the, where we all agree that the person should be released. We also share some of the same concerns about her safety. Now, how we define what kinds of restrictions should be placed on whom to protect those, we may disagree on. But we agree on the fact that she should be protected from threats and her children should be protected. So it's a matter of uh, working out the details of how these things will be put in place. I also think that um, because she's going to be in the system for a long time and because of the nature of the offense, and if you uh, re reverting back to the facts of this case, it actually uh, it contemplates a situation where she's pled guilty mm -hmm. to this offense. That's right. So, so she's been in the system for a long time under pretrial services supervision. Given her uh, lack of a criminal uh, history and the fact that she probably, according to the facts here, played a very minimal role, which is not unusual in these kinds of cases or in cases involving women offenders, quite likely down the road, Bob and I are going to come to a point where I'm going to be looking for a type of disposition that will involve greater cooperation vis-a-vis -vis her role in mm -hmm. terms of trying to work out a disposition in the case. So it's not the unusual situation in a case like this where we would find ourselves working together but not necessarily having the same interest or compatible roles. Right. Uh, Cindy, uh, let's go with that. She's pled guilty. We're, we're in a post-conviction situation now. In prior conversations, we've talked about uh, not necessarily how the pretrial services role officer officer's role has changed, and David, to jump in, um, but how perhaps the attitude of the defendant has changed. Could you go into that a little bit, and then I'll go to David and get his in input. Well, it could go one of two ways. Okay. Um, often their anxiety is, is relieved once they've pled guilty and they have you know, some idea of where the case is going. Mm -hmm. But in her case, it may actually increase if she starts to become more and more concerned or worried that she's going to maybe be sentenced to a period of time in jail or in a halfway house and be separated from her children and who's going to take care of her children and you don't often know what the answer to all that's going to be in terms of her sentence until the very end. So her anxiety level may actually increase. And in terms of communication, like Sig has been talking about, I think it's important. I have a couple of mental health cases where 
I need to keep in touch not only with the treatment provider, but with her attorney to make sure, you know, what stage are we at and what are you going to be communicating to her because she is relatively, you know, fragile and we want to make sure that there's support available, you know, if, if there's a, an outcome coming to her that she needs, she's going to be shocked by or something to that effect or need to be prepared for. Mm -hmm. um, so it can go one of two ways. And what was, how, what's been your experience in this particular case that you've been dealing with? Was, was that, well, did she get more anxious? Did she get less, less anxious? She had a lot to deal with because that was the case where she has the cancer as well. Right. I think less anxious, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and she was facing either the short term of incarceration or the term of probation, if I recall correctly. Right. And she does have provisions if, you know, she does have to serve a short period of time in a halfway house. She has relatives that can assist. Mm -hmm. Um, but what's she doesn't your role? What's your role? I mean, w w well, and that's something that when David mentioned it earlier, just to expound on that, I think it's really important for the pretrial officer. You know, none of these issues may be even available to go find referrals mm -hmm. if no one's talked to her and found out that they're issues. Right. So, for a pretrial officer, when you know you're caught in that rat race of you know running to lock up and running to court, and mm -hmm. somebody's checking in with you instead of just the regular check-in, you just have to be mindful that sitting and talking with someone for five or ten minutes and, and really kind of getting, fleshing out what's going on in their life is going to unearth certain things that may need to be addressed. Maybe it may even rise to a level that you want an additional condition. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important, uh, again, as Cindy stated, once you don't know if they're going to be get a sentence of uh, probation or short-term incarceration, just to have more maybe increased face-to-face contact with them and you can tell sometimes over the phone if they're really down. Well let's talk a little bit. You just can drop what you're doing and you can just give them that extra 10 minute conversation to help talk them through some things which can be very ben beneficial until you can get to see them face to face or talk to the treatment provider. And I would really want to know in her case where she's where she is in relationship to her husband. You know, does she want to be separated from her husband? How long have they been married? How long has the abuse been going on? Because it'll give you a good sense of how how committed she is to going on her own, how much she wants to look at reconciliation, and those are going to all be important. How has she ever been involved in any kind of domestic violence counseling? Mm -hmm. What does she know about domestic violence? Does it matter at all uh, whether the, the child that she's particularly concerned about, the 15-year-old, is a boy or a girl? I mean, would that, do you think that that would matter? Or, I mean, certainly it's serious regardless. But matter would it be in matter in, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, mean, a 15-year-old boy is going to be acting very differently than a, uh -huh. is, is likely to act out very differently than right. a 15-year-old girl. That, but what that 15-year-old is going to need in terms of resources and support is going to be is going to be similar. Okay. I mean, you're going to want somebody who can intervene, who mm -hmm. can understand those gender differences and be responsive to those gender differences. Okay. And the 15-year-old boy, you know, there there are, I'm sure going to be a lot of issues about watching his dad mm -hmm. beat up on his mother, and that has that can go a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm very important that that get addressed at that point. Mm -hmm. Judge Gravel? Um, I was just uh, thinking a little bit about what Justice Ginsburg said and what we've all been talking about, about how our decisions really inevitably about women inevitably affect many others. And here there's a whole constellation of people. And I'm also feeling that we don't really have the instruments to <coughs> affect other people the way we should. So we can talk about bartering and, and networking and things like that. but. <clears throat> I'm left with the concern that we don't have the, the ability to do what we know we ought to do with these individuals. Excuse me. <coughs> Good conversation. Well, uh, go ahead, Susan. I, I think that's a very <coughs> important point and one that we have to take on because if we don't have the resources, then we're going to see them back in the courtroom and back in the system within a very short period of time. So what will it take to have those kind of supportive resources that these families are going to need? Well, you, you, you just raised an interesting point that um, I want to respond to about the possibility of them finding themselves back in court. And this also relates to the issue of roles that we, the various roles that we play in communication. 
uh, we all have, to some degree, a very uh, uh, an interest, a, a vested interest in this person not finding him or herself back in court. And I think when we first look at the roles that we play, um, Cindy and David work for the court, and so while they they certainly have an interest in my client, they are accountable to the court for whether she complies with the conditions of release. And Bob, of course, cares about her her safety and, and her concerns. He also cares about doing justice, which means not only protecting her, but also holding her accountable for this crime that she's pled guilty to. I'm the only player in the system who is actually representing her, whose interest she has at heart, which means not only do we have privileged communications, but because of that, she may feel more comfortable sharing certain things with me. But if I also have a dialogue established with the other parties involved here in this process, we can communicate on things about which we have a common interest. Mm -hmm. And if my client is not complying with a condition of release, for example, if David or Cindy felt comfortable calling me, mm -hmm. perhaps we could together flesh out what that is because they're going to have an obligation to report to the court noncompliance, in which case Bob is going to become aware mm -hmm. that she's not complying. That's going to complicate the process. Mm -hmm. It's going to potentially derail the success that we're all in agreement uh, we should work toward for right. her. Bob, and without, without that information, I'm left with no other choice right. but mm -hmm. to, of course, start asking for sanctions for failing to comply with those conditions. I, I do want to make one other point that sure. we, everyone's been talking about resources and the need to connect in with uh, the local community resources to deal with some of these issues. I would just suggest that people just don't wait. Don't wait until you've got uh, you know, a woman offender sitting in front of you to finally start making those calls. By all means. I mean, do them now. Try to make yeah. those, as Susan pointed out, so you know who to call and you're not trying to negotiate your way through. Sta for, as one example, each state has its own domestic violence coordinating council or coordinating committee. It's a multidisciplinary group of people from lots of different organizations that deal with adults, women, and some children, so that you can start making those connections now so that when the case shows up, two months, three months, six months, next year, you can, you can go ahead and actually pick up the phone and know who to call. And that's true of substance abuse treatment resources as well and mental health resources. And of course you have to find out what the quality of those are and whether they're gender specific and you need to ask more questions. But most localities have some systems of care. Mm -hmm. This is a good discussion. I want to now open it up to the field. Questions, comments, um, and before I do that, I wanted to also alert the field to a program that the center uh, did a couple of years ago in 1998 on domestic violence. It was abuser-focused, but it does give a very nice foundation and groundwork to what is domestic violence. This was for federal probation and pretrial services officers, though I certainly think the bench could benefit as well uh, from the information. So if anybody in the field is interested in that, they should contact me and I can put them in touch with the folks at the center who can help them with that program. Um, now let's go to the field. Uh, my understanding is that we've got the Northern District of Illinois Pretrial Services Office on the line. Hello? How about the Northern District of, uh, how about the Middle District of uh, Michigan? Okay, we're getting some feedback from Detroit. Hi, is the Northern District of Illinois with us? All right, well, let's continue here. And if the Northern District of Illinois tunes in or Eastern District, ah, there you are. I heard, I heard a voice. Okay. Hello? Yes. Hello? Is this the Northern District of Illinois? This is the Northern District of Illinois. What's your question or comment for the panel? And if, and if you could turn down your television, that would uh, help with the feedback in the studio. How would the court sanction this defendant for noncompliance uh, if she totally decided not to go to any of the counseling services that we referred her to? Good question. All right, who wants to take that one? Well, Judge Gavi, since you're the one who's going to be doing the right, sanctioning. Right, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to take that question to say, first of all, it's an excellent one because I think the questioner has got a lot of experience and knows that our hands are very tied in this situation because we have to consider those three children and we have to consider that disabled mother. 
So we would be working in increments. We would be trying to figure out how we can leave her in place, uh, but at the same time acknowledging or you know, having her acknowledge that she has to abide by our conditions. So uh, that's when I turned to a very resourceful pretrial service officer talking to the defense counsel to come up usually, and I want to say this, in most situations where we've had violations of conditions, I go into the courtroom with a great expectation that defense counsel and pretrial services officers have come up with a solution to the problem that's presented to me. And in this case, I think it is a difficult one, whether you could have her uh, go so have sort of a daycare situation in the sense she'd have to go report somewhere during the day when the children were in school, do something that in, in made clear that she has to obey the court. This is, this is an absolute condition, but interfere as little as possible with the lives, the already fragile and difficult lives of her and her family. I'd be interested in what the pretrial services mm -hmm. officers, what incremental uh, work you I could think, do. Uh, day treatment, mental health services would be very, very appropriate. And as a, a trump card, we can do inpatient mental health services if they continue not to comply. But like a day treatment type of program for mental health services where kids are safe at home and she can return every evening, I think it would be very, very good. Well, you might even be able to work up something on the week. I don't know whether you could have any weekend requiring her to report somewhere Correct. for the weekend, uh, as we do sometimes in sentencing, so that she'd know maybe they'd be able to have a surrogate there in the weekend, take care of the children yes. easier than during the week. Mm -hmm. Cindy, any response? I can't really think of anything additional. Okay. I mean, one of the things that we talked about uh, in a prior conversation, Judge Gavi, is how we define danger to the community. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in this case, it's a little bit different. I just, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Because I thought that that was very uh, a creative uh, interpretation. Right. Well, I think we all agree this is not the case where she is, poses any danger, other than the danger of the children, uh, the this danger we think of in the drug situation, going out, having guns, and, and that sort of danger to the community. But it's a much more subtle kind of danger. And I think really Bob spoke to it about the danger to the children, the danger to the mother. There's so much that can that she's being relied on so much that uh, we're really going to upset the apple cart of her whole environment. So there is danger if we do not appropriately address her needs, the needs of the children, and the needs of her mother. All kinds of things can happen that we may not think of as, as danger in the same way as, as someone with a gun, but really uh, have the potential for lifelong problems for those involved. I, I agree with the judges. This is an excellent question because this is an example of areas where we might have a common desire and a, a, a common interest in a desired outcome, but we may differ on how to arrive there. And this would be a situation that would present that because if we found ourselves back before the court, I would want to focus back on the two concerns of the Bail Reform Act, which is uh, risk of flight and danger mm -hmm. to the community. And, and more specifically, who is posing what danger. Mm -hmm. And my position would be that my client uh, satisfies both of the concerns that are addressed within the, the Bail Reform Act, mm -hmm. that she poses no danger and no risk of flight, and therefore mm -hmm. her liberty shouldn't be re uh, restricted. Mm -hmm. Notwithstanding that, I would still recognize that, that the conditions that the court has tried to impose uh, are in her interest, her long-term interest. And maybe it would be an appropriate time to take a look back and try to understand why she's not complying and see whether maybe what we've imposed upon her is unrealistic mm -hmm. in terms of her capacity. And, and maybe scale it back a little bit uh, so that she could comply with the court, but at the same time not simply restrict her liberty merely because she couldn't impose a standard that A, doesn't go toward an assessment of risk of danger or flight, but also just aren't realistic for her to meet given her her emotional state at this point. Let me, let me, let me, let me um, interrupt because we only got a couple minutes left in the segment and I want, uh, my understanding is that we've got the Eastern District of Michigan Pretrial Services Office on the line. Michigan Eastern, are you there? Yes. What's your question or comment or reaction to what we've been talking about thus far? Uh, we have a question in regards to are there any ideals or plans in place to address the, the vacuum that women with children often often fall into regarding placement issues when they're placed on pretrial release. Reactions? I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by placement issues. Meaning, meaning, oftentimes when we have children, uh, women refer, refer to uh, housing facilities, they often do not take children. I see. Okay, and that's. And it becomes a problem in terms of re uh, recommending bond. I, I, I understand the question now. Thank you. I mean, I think it's a huge problem that we do not have 
programs for women and their kids, and it's a problem in every area of the country. And I think it's really un incumbent on us to recognize that and not just simply separate moms from kids, but try to find reasonable accommodations, alternatives to that separation. But um, it, it's a very tough issue in every single community. We, we face that every single day. And very often the only alternative is for the children to go with another caretaker optimally and a mom to go into treatment depending on, on what her issues are. In this case, with this particular woman, given that she has a low-level depression, I would really I can't imagine that she couldn't be treated on an outpatient basis and managed very well on an outpatient basis. So if, if she were to comply with treatment, I, I can't see why that family would have to be separated. I think as a defense lawyer, you have some concerns, obviously, when you begin a pattern of separating a mother from the child in terms of the future Absolutely. consequences. It, absolutely. It goes back to the point we were discussing earlier in terms of how it's going to impact her ability to process decisions that she's going to have to make later if she's distracted by concerns uh, about her children. Mm -hmm. Also, once the, the custody is, is taken from the, the mother, I understand that that can be more difficult for it to be reestablished mm -hmm. as a matter of the legal, uh, legal entitlements right. or legal rights. Well, another collateral legal impact, too, is that um, she's now receiving public assistance. And in our facts, she's pled guilty to a felony offense. Mm -hmm. And so that's no longer going to be available to her. So she's going to have additional stresses in terms of finding a way to support herself. I think that's a really important point, and that's something that we want to emphasize, and not something that's necessarily on the radar screen of the pretrial services offices or the probation offices later on. I mean, you've got a situation here where somebody that has a sporadic employment history, I mean, how is she going to be able to support well, this I think, But I think it's also important, too, before we even talk about how she's going to do it, is how it's going to impact her, because my focus as a defense counsel intuitively would be to, to focus on addressing her legal concerns. Pretrial is concerned about her complying. Right. And the judge is going to impose, impose a sentence at some point, but in this case, the magistrate judge is also concerned about her complying. And, and Bob is concerned about reaching a disposition in this case, in addition to the collateral concerns about safety. But she is concerned about other things. Mm -hmm. right. And, and, and those other concerns that she has are going to directly impact the things that we're most directly concerned about in our respective roles, and we have to recognize that. Very important and difficult issues. Uh, thank you all. Um, we've reached the end of our, our discussion on pretrial services issues. As we go to our break, let's take a look at the learning principles that we've covered in this segment, and we'll see you in five minutes. <laughs>